Okay, go ahead and title your page DNA structure. So just a couple bullet point facts about DNA structure. You've heard of double helix before. That's the overall molecular shape. There's something called a sugar phosphate backbone. Okay. And then the other thing is that there are these, when we say that there's rungs, what we're referring to is this like, we're saying it's basically a ladder. And you know how ladders have rungs that you climb up? Those rungs on the DNA structure are made from nitrogenous bases. And what those are, those are the letters G, T, C, and A that we're also familiar with. The other thing is that DNA runs in an anti-parallel uh, strands. So basically you got one side of the DNA running the opposite direction of the other. So one side is uh, goes three prime to five prime. So this is probably this is probably where um, we're starting to get some new information. You guys probably haven't heard of three prime, five prime. I'll explain what that means in a minute. But the other side goes five prime to three prime. So this is where we get this anti-parallel thing. Is is it? Um, if you look at the DNA as a ladder, and this side goes five prime to three prime, that means that this other side goes three prime to five prime. So you've kind of got this like one going this direction, the other going that direction. And this is significant. This is really important because uh, you will see that it causes some weird things to happen with the DNA replication. Okay, the other thing, and by the way, students, why are we, do we really need to have these this language like double helix, anti-parallel? Yeah, you need to, you need to be able to, you might get asked to describe DNA. And if you do, you better, you better be ready. You better have the vocabulary to describe its structure. So the other thing you could say is that um, DNA has complementary base pairing. And what that means is that, that A's bind with T's, C's bind with G's. So adenine, which is A, only binds with thymine right and then <clears throat> what was the other one guanine only binds with cytosine so those are the those are the rules right and we call that complementary base pairing okay um the general structure, so DNA is composed of repeating nucleotides. Uh, or did I say competing? I meant repeating nucleotides. And the nucleotide is the monomer, right? <clears throat> so we're going to look at that uh, up close. So if you took a single repeating, so if you took a single nucleotide and you looked at it, it would consist of a sugar, a deoxyribose sugar. Off of this carbon atom here is a phosphate group. And then you have uh, the nitrogenous base over here. Typically, um, it's a ring structure, the nitrogenous base. And in this case, uh, this is adenine, okay? But just know that this nitrogenous base here is variable, right? You got four options for what that could be. Could be adenine, could be guanine, thymine, or cytosine. But anyway, uh, this whole thing here is the repeating unit, and it's called a nucleotide. So how do the... How do you fit thousands of these together? How do you connect a thousand nucleotides together? Where do the bonds form? That's what we're going to look at next. Repeating nucleotides. 
Okay, so let's let's go ahead and draw the whole thing together. Make some room. You're gonna end up with a picture like this. So make sure you got enough space on your page. Everybody good here? I'll I'll pause for a minute so you guys can catch up drawing. But yeah, you could get asked to describe DNA's structure on like as a FRQ. So if you got FRQ like that, you would want to be able to say all these things here. Double helix, and a parallel, complementary base pairing, composed of nucleotides. Be able to describe all that. Go up? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. All right, so let's move on now to the DNA structure. So you can label it DNA structure continued. I mean, this is, we're just continuing DNA structure, but now we have, we're have we going to have the, a big picture of it. We're going to draw, draw it all together. So this picture, uh, like I said, if you want to see what it looks like when it's on paper, it's this top th picture. Okay, so that's kind of how it will look. Uh, so start, let, let's go ahead and start with by drawing a nucleotide. So remember, the nucleotide has three parts. And we're actually going to simplify the drawing a little bit. We're just going to make every nucleotide will just be a rectangle. Make it simpler. So start with a deoxyribose sugar. Go ahead and add the phosphate. And then, for, like I said, for the nucleotide, it's just going to be a rectangle. You can pick whatever letter you want. I'm going to go ahead and call it a thymine. Okay, so here's the weird part, though. On the other side, you're going to have these hydrogen bonds here in the middle. And then there will be a another nitrogenous base. Uh, anybody know what it would be? Uh, a, C, T, G, what would it be? What does it have to be based on the rules? It's got to be adenine, right? Okay, but the weird part is that over here on this other side, everything is upside down, right? It's going the other direction. So make sure you draw it like that. Because again, uh, the reason for this is that it's what we call anti-parallel. So one side, the side over here, we can go ahead and label this five prime, five prime. And then we're going to label this end over here. I want you guys to add a, an OH, a hydroxyl group to this carbon atom. And we're going to call this end the three prime end. Okay. So there's, a, there's a reason that we're keeping track of this and you will find out soon why it is like what the significance of three prime five prime is uh and here's how it gets its name okay if you take the carbon atoms in the sugar here can everybody uh go ahead and just darken i want you guys to put some dots on here these dots what they represent are carbon atoms And we, we have these carbon atoms numbered. And the notation says that this is carbon atom one, this is carbon atom two, carbon atom three, carbon atom four, and carbon atom five. So if you guys can get those numbers on there, this is going to help you understand why we call this the five prime end. And the reason is because that phosphate group right here is bound to the fifth carbon atom and that's why we call it five prime end so let's let's apply the same numbering system to the sugar over here so we got carbon atom one carbon atom two ah there you go carbon atom three and so you can see that the hydroxyl group is attached to the 
carbon atom number three, and that's why we call this the three prime end, three prime. Okay, so, so we now have one rung of the ladder built. Let's add some more rungs. So we're gonna, we're gonna continue this structure. And uh, this will be a cytosine. Guanine. Let's do, let's just do three rows. I think that will suffice. But I want you to use your imagination and ima imagine that this continues on a thousand more times. Like say that it just goes. Say that we have a thousand more rungs this way and a bunch more that way. And then what you would have then is you'd have this big long strand. Okay, so we've got we've got those rungs. However, do you guys notice that these rungs are not connected to each other yet? So what I want you to show is I want you to draw a bond between the third carbon atom right there to the phosphate of the next nucleotide. Everybody got that? So draw that in there and do it again right here. And then same here. And then same here. Make sure that the bond is formed between the phosphate and the carbon atom number three. Double check that, please. Because if you get that wrong, um, you're drawing the molecule wrong. Okay, so so there you go. Uh, there's so what are those bonds called? Let's label that. So that bond that basically connects the first nucleotide to the next is called a <laughs> phosphodiester phosphodiester bond. And by the way, it is covalent. And the reason that that's important is that it's very strong, which means it's not easily broken. However, here in the middle, these bonds that exist here between the nucleotides are called hydrogen bonds, and they are weak which means that they are easily broken. Uh, and so um, <clears throat> we're going to add a little note here that DNA helicase unzips DNA by breaking these bonds. So if you can picture uh, like well, let's let's make a little well, a larger molecule here. Where you got it like this, let's say. Can everybody picture what this would look like if you unzipped the DNA? So it'd kind of be like this, wouldn't it? You got like something that's unzipping it. So if you had like an enzyme right here and it's moving this direction, it's going to be breaking those hydrogen bonds that exist in the middle and therefore kind of separating the strands, right? Unzipping those strands. So it's those hydrogen bonds that because they're kind of weaker, it allows DNA to unzip and the strands can be easily separated. Okay. Um, so let's say a few things now about, oh, you know what? You know what, we were supposed to say something here about Yeah, so so this is this is also referred to as the sugar phosphate uh, backbone. So let's label that. 
sugar. So when we refer, refer to the sides of the DNA molecule, the, the sides of the ladder, so to speak, that's what's called the sugar phosphate backbone. It's those sides that are composed of the uh, phosphodiester bonds. So I put that in quotes, sugar phosphate backbone. All right. I think we're good. Oh, you know what? Um, also label this end as, so if, again, once again, if this is carbon atom one, this is carbon atom two, and this is carbon atom three, then that would make this the three prime end. And then down here, if this is carbon atom one, two, three, four, and five, then that would make this the five prime end. So now we see, now we see uh, this three prime, three prime, five prime thing more clearly. I think it probably makes more sense to you now, now that you see the carbon atom numbering. <clears throat> anyway, um, there is something else of importance that I want to point out. Okay. The Okay, so the the can everybody add a little note right here? Draw an arrow to this hydroxyl group right here. And we're going to say a few things. We're going to say that the OH, also known as the hydroxyl group, is reactive, which means nucleotides can be added, can be added on here. Okay, so we can. Uh, another way of saying that is we can easily form a bond here. However, that is not the case with the five prime end. So what I want to show you here is that on this end, it's harder to add. Well, I'm going to just say not possible. Well, I'm going to say harder um, to add nucleotides here. In other words, it just doesn't happen. The cell doesn't do that. So the rule then is that nucleotides are only added to the three prime end. So the DNA, so if you want to grow a DNA strand, you can, you have to grow it in the three prime the five prime to three prime direction. So we could add, we can add nucleotides down here at this three prime. And we could also add them to this end up here too, but you can never add them to the five prime ends because they don't, they don't have the hydroxyl group. And so they're not reactive. They're not disposed to forming new bonds. If that makes sense. All right, so let's say a few things now about DNA replication. So we're now moving on to that topic. <clears throat> so, to, to, so DNA replication is where you are making a copy of the DNA, right? That's what it means. And it occurs in both mitosis and meiosis. The process is semi-conservative. I'll show you what that means. Okay, so instead of explaining what semi-conservative is, I'd rather just give you a little drawing. So uh, if you have extra colors, you could get those. Um, 
like if you have two colors that might help but anyway they there was a time when we didn't know what how dna replication was so there were a couple competing models And so picture a DNA molecule. And there are three competing mod models, right? One idea was that it was fully conservative, meaning that the original DNA molecule would be preserved. And then there is the semi-conservative model, which means that some of it was conserved. And then there was this other idea that, okay, maybe DNA is copied in spurts, like little bits, which would be the dispersive model. But either way, we knew that we had to end up with two copies of two clones of the genetic material. So in the conservative model, what you would have is the, the original DNA strand would be completely the same. And then you would have this new piece of DNA that was made. So, there, so does it make sense why it was called conservative? That just means that the original DNA was conserved and uh, kept intact. Now, what the semi-conservative model suggested was that, well, maybe instead of that, maybe what we have is one of the sides of the DNA is conserved, but the other is brand new. So that's semi-conservative. And then dispersive is kind of funny because dispersive is where it's like, okay, maybe there's like chunks that are done one at a time. And you end up with something like this, where you've got like pieces that and that's that's like the dispersive model. So they did uh they the way they figured this out was they did a bunch of like a bunch of experiments by applying radioactive labels to nucleotides. So they basically just like injected these radioactive nucleotides into the cells that would light up um, if they were bombarded with a particular frequency of light. And what it would do is it kind of illuminate. Well, actually that might, it might not be that it lit up, but there, there was a way in which they tagged these nucleotides and were able to, I think it was by mass actually. And they were able to uh, determine where those nucleotides went. And they found out that the semi-conservative model was the correct one. So put a star next to that. that that's, the, that's the way it actually happens is that one, um, one of the strands is kept intact. And what we call that, by the way, you guys, go ahead and label... So right here, where we have the semi-conservative model, I want you to label the blue strand as the template strand. And this kind of makes sense. The semi-conservative model definitely makes sense because it's like, okay, the cell, like this would be the simplest way to do it, right? It'd be to separate the DNA strands and then one of the strands just acts as a template and you basically just copy it off of that template. Okay, so that's what that's gonna. That's how it's gonna play out. Okay, so once once we had established this, once we knew that it was the semi-conservative model, we then that was the first clue as to how this whole process worked. So we went, okay, so if it's the semi-conservative model, then there must be something going on that's splitting the DNA, like separating those strands, and that was the DNA helicase we realized that DNA helicase must unzip or separate those strands so that we can then start copying it, right? Exposing the, the sequence, if you will. 
All right, so, so what that looks like then is we've got the DNA ladder, right? That looks like this. And then we've got this big old enzyme that's hanging out in here. And this enzyme is called DNA helicase. Okay, yeah. And then, um, so then it would look kind of like this where, <clears throat> The DNA is being separated. So can you guys kind of picture this moving? Which direction is this helicase moving? Is it moving from left to right or is it moving from right to left? It's moving from right to left, right? In other words, the DNA helicase is moving this direction. And as it moves that way, it's separating the DNA strands. So kind of picture that in your mind, okay? I, this is You really do have to kind of use your imagination. But I, I will sh be showing you very shortly an animation that kind of 3D computer animates all this. And so you can see it happening with your own eyes, right? When it, when it comes to just a drawing, you have to kind of use your imagination a little bit. Okay, so students, the three prime, five prime, we have to identify that. So I'm telling you right now that this was the five prime end right here, and that this end here was the three prime. And so that so then that would mean down here, what would that mean that this is? Can you guys figure that out? Well... If the top on the top, this side was five prime, then the same strand, the, the other end of that same strand must be the three prime, right? And then down here, that must mean that this is the five prime. Okay, so now that we've established that, what do you guys remember? I, what did I tell you about nucleotides? Which, which end can they be added to? Right. If we go back up, Mr. Roth told you that the three prime end is the only it's the only end that you can actually add new nucleotides to. So what that means then is that we could well, hang on a second. I'm getting ahead of myself. The, the logic there is sound, but I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself and I'm going to confuse you. Let's just start with the DNA primer. So can everybody draw a little piece right here? Or, I'm sorry, a um, RNA primer. So there's going to be this little piece that connects there and it's, and it's going to initiate a primer just means, uh, so what does it mean to prime something? If you're going to prime it, you're basically initiating or preparing. So this is uh, initiates DNA replication. So when that primer binds to that, to that piece of DNA, it's going to initiate DNA replication. So draw an enzyme here. This enzyme is called DNA polymerase. And we remember that any word that ends in ace is an enzyme. And we also know that polymer means many, or poly means many. And so this little enzyme is responsible for connecting all of the many nucleotides together to form this strand. Also, students draw an arrow indicating that DNA polymerase is going to move in this direction. Okay, now, back to what I was saying before. I wanted to 
emphasize this three prime, five prime. How do we know that we can add nucleotides to this strand right here? So we're going to say, we're going to ask the question, can we add nucleotides here? Okay, well, <clears throat> um, to figure that out, we have to think about the three prime, five prime direction. If this is the three prime end, then on the opposite side here, this other strand, this must be the five prime end, right? So label that right there. And then that would make this end the three prime end. So what I'm referring to now is the growing strand, the new strand, right? This is, so just a reminder, okay? This is the template strand. And then this is the new strand or newly synthesized strand. And so what, what we find out is that yes, indeed, we can add nucleotides to, to this end right here because it's three prime. So what that means then is that DNA replication can proceed in this direction. In fact, that's, that's the direction it's gonna go. All right, so next, what I wanna think about now is which direction, so we have to look at this strand down here. Which direction And I want you guys to, t I'm actually going to pause. I'm going to go ahead and pause the lecture, and I'm going to ask you to discuss this in your groups. Which direction will the new strand be synthesized? So, the que so okay, the question is, the answer, you have two options. A, left to right, or B, right to left. I need you to have an answer in two minutes. So you gotta, you're gonna have to discuss this with your group and think about it. And you can draw, you can sketch it out, but remember the rules of three prime, five prime and how that's gonna work. Okay, talk about it, go ahead. So the newly synthesized strand on the bottom will be which side will be three prime, which side will be five prime. No, it's like it's so so it's 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 it's
piece of DNA and this new piece of DNA, the newly synthesized strand, this would have to be the three prime end, right? Because it's always opposite of the strand below it. And then that would make this the five prime. And we know that we can only add nucleotides to the three prime end, which means it has to move this direction. Okay, now this is awkward, okay? The reason this is awkward, so we're gonna say awkward. Uh, awkward because DNA synthesis just like as a as a whole you could say is moving to the left oh gosh okay so wait a minute what do we mean by that what i'm saying you guys is that the whole process of dna replication it's going this way isn't it right dna replication is going moving this way but for that bottom strand it has to go that way so how's that going to work how are we going to so – no problem for the top strand, right? Because it's like, okay, DNA replication is moving that way anyways. And so for this one, it's just DNA helicase and DNA uh, polymerase, just, they just go like this until the whole strand is done. No problem. But down here, this is going like this, and then this one has to go like that. So what do we do? Well, it does this crazy thing where it, it, it – what it does is it like – does one little bit at a time and then it releases and comes back and does it bit by bit. So it kind of looked like this. It would be like, can everybody kind of picture that? Crazy. And um, you'll have, you'll see in our little video, we're going to watch how, the, how it pulls that off, but it all need all, you know, all, all that is to say about that is that it just complicates the process. Makes it a little more, a little more complicated. Okay, next. Uh, oh yeah, this is another, this is another RNA primer, right? We know that you have to have the primer to start the DNA replication. This, once again, is the same good old DNA polymerase. All right, so now uh, you have to realize that there is also this, it's, it's already copied this, this segment right here. And so, so <clears throat> what do we do then when this segment meets up with this segment? How do we fuse the two segments together? Because if the, the bottom strand is doing it one fragment at a time, well then how do you connect the fragments together to get one continuous strand? And that's where DNA ligase comes into play. DNA ligase joins the Okazaki fragments together. Okay, so why are they called Okazaki fragments? Because Professor Okazaki was the one who found them. So he named them after himself. And I mean, gosh, I would do that too. Like if I discovered it, I'd, they if I would have discovered it, they would have been called Roth fragments. And that would have been awesome. But I, w I didn't do it. So they're called Okazaki fragments. But anyway, the DNA ligase will it will connect those fragments together to form one normal continuous strand. Okay, so what what do we call this? We call this strand down here the lagging strand because it lags behind, it causes problems, it has to be copied one bit at a time. The lagging strand. Okay. <clears throat> All 
All right, so here's one more bit of information that we're going to write down, and then we're going to conclude our notes after that. So we're almost there. Um, but, um, oh, yeah, uh, just, just for your information, this continues. So I'm going to draw it as like a dotted line. But just picture it like this. So the DNA, so really what we're kind of looking at here is like a bubble that formed in the DNA. And it just so happened to start, this is what we would call the origin of replication. All right, very good. Okay, so what I was going to say next is that um, up here, a small amount of DNA on the five prime end is left uncopied. And that leads to chromosome shortening every time the DNA is copied. <clears throat> so why why can't the process co copy the full uh, DNA? Because something about I don't know that enzyme. I guess I guess once that enzyme gets right up to the end, it can't quite copy those last few nucleotides, and so every time it goes through, it actually gets a little bit shorter every time. There is a, we, we believe, some scientists believe that that is part of the aging process. Part of the reason we have a, a limit to our age is that our, our genetic material gets shorter and shorter every time it gets copied. And it's thought that that might be part of the reason for aging. Okay. The other thing we're going to say, uh, Oh, so so the way one of the ways we combat this is we so to protect so to protect against this again so to protect against shortening. Um, repeating non-coding caps. So non-coding, that just means that it's not a real gene, okay? It's still DNA, but it's never uh, transcribed or translated. So you got these repeating non-coding caps called telomeres. Telomere. Help prevent the loss of important genes. These telomeres shorten every time DNA is copied. And like I said again, that's thought to be part of part of what causes aging, the aging process, the telomere shortening. All right, well, any questions about DNA synthesis? Very good.